You're listening to Punisher Waterfowls, the Union 0430 podcast. Brought to you by Real Geese Decoys, the most technologically advanced silhouette decoy on the market. First Light, the best hunting gear on the planet. Go farther, stay longer. And Ducklander Calls, tradition, education, and quality. Built to hunt. Punisher Waterfowls The Refuge is presented by Quick Coys, the fastest, deployable, most portable, lifelike motion decoy product ever invented for duck hunters. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Union 0430. This is episode 198 and um, a new friend. I've got a new friend, Aaron Carter from Boss Shot Shells. i uh, been chatting with you for a while, Aaron. Uh, finally got a chance to meet you in Baton Rouge, so welcome to the show, buddy. Um, Appreciate I'm, that. Thanks for having me. I know you're super busy, so um, we only got Aaron on audio today. He is that's how busy he is so we managed to curve some time out of his schedule so we got aaron coming to us all the way from aaron are you you're in michigan right no i'm in tupelo mississippi oh crap okay i thought you were in yep. michigan okay so aaron's in michigan we've got craig nope, coming I'm, to us oh, i'm sorry. in mississippi <laughs> aaron's mississippi. in mississippi yes sorry buddy <laughs> aaron is in mississippi craig is in Wabashin. i'm in odessa um, we're going to get this, uh, great show going. Um, but before we get going too far, I got to explain some things that I've been getting some messages about. So we have three sponsors for the show. Craig bear with, or, uh, Aaron bear with me with this. Okay. We have three sponsors for the show. Our sponsors are first light real geese and duck lander calls. Those are our sponsors. And without them, this show would not be possible. Last week, I started adding some commercials to the show as a thank you to some of the businesses that wanted to sponsor the refuge at the Toronto Sportsman Show. So two totally different entities, two totally different sponsorship criteria, I guess, or whatever you want to call it. So just because everyone is, for some fucking reason, got to message me about all this and ask me about it. So anyways. That's where we are. That's the sponsorship stuff. That's it away. And of course, I cannot um, forget Captain Jeff Coates, the voice of the union. All right. That's it away, Aaron. Sort about that, buddy. Um, All good. All good. I understand. Craig, um, you never met Aaron, but um, I got to tell you, I've been talking to Bobby Hayes a bit. Um, and I know, you know, Bobby, Aaron, and we're just talking about the Delta show and, and stuff. And we were talking about, you know, the number of people there and, and the, and the vendors and all of the booths that was set up. And I told Bobby, your guy's booth was probably one of the most busiest, um, and popular booths that I noticed at the show. Would you agree with that? I would, I would agree with that. We were, we were slam packed for the majority of the show. I know I didn't, uh, it that's, and that's a good thing. Cause I mean, it we is. go to shows to sell product and move product, talk to customers. And, um, I like to get a chance to walk around and say, Hey, and see everybody. And sometimes if I do good, if I don't, well, that means we're busy. So, um, I hate, I didn't get to talk to everybody I wanted to, but it was, uh, for, for great reason. So, but yeah, it was it was all together a really good show. Man, um, no like, complaints at all there. No, I bet. Well, like I said, man, like I came over I bet you I must have come over at least a half a dozen times to try and get your attention to have a chat with you and I I just couldn't. You were just like you said, you were slammed. And when I oh, yeah. fin- when I finally did get a chance to chat with you like I felt like, man, I gotta, I gotta leave him alone because he's got so many people <laughs> here that wants to talk to him and I'm just here shooting the shit. Right. So I was like, okay, I'm just going to leave Aaron alone and I'll chat with him some other time or whatever, because you were, you were slammed. And, and I think that's a testament, Craig, you can jump in here any second. Um, but Aaron, I think that's a testament to your product, right? Like I haven't shot boss um, because as you know, 
it's easier to get at ammo in Afghanistan than it is into Canada. So, um, <laughs> apparently so. <laughs> yeah, apparently so. So I haven't shot boss ammo and, and I, so I can't speak to the quality, but the people that I know, uh, that are shooting, it speaks highly of it. And then when I see the type of lineups and, and crowds gathered around your booth in Baton Rouge, it tells me that the quality and and the product is is exactly what people are looking for. Well, I appreciate that, and you know, I I would I like to say that's a testament of our product as well, along with our our great customer service within you know the whole team, and and that's and that's what pushes us to where we are and why we continue to do what we do. So, yeah, I will, I will say that. Yeah, absolutely, buddy. I I really wanted to get into. Um, because I, and I got to admit, I haven't, I haven't done my research on this. So, um, one of the joys of being able to get you to come on the show is you can dumb it down for me and explain it. Um, but I really want to understand the reasoning for the copper because I, to the best of my knowledge, nobody else is doing this, right? Like you're the only, you're the only ammunition company that that's doing this copper within your, uh, within your pellets. That is, that is correct. And, and so, and so, and I will also say that because we have trademarked and patented that, that as okay. well, because of it, its performance that we have found. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so in the simpler terms of trying to dumb this down for you, so like for, for comparison, so going yep. back to the lead days, mm -hmm. lead, lead was always, you know, it's a malleable alloy. So when you, when you give it compression, it, it deforms. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so back in the day, I think that was the turning point for them was they said, okay, how can we make this lead shot better? And if you put a harder alloy that is not much different in weight density yep. wise, mm -hmm. it's not going to alter it enough, but it gives it a hard enough, factor to where it can still hold a spherical form okay well whenever whenever brandon set out to how can i make the the bismuth pellet the next step up how can we keep not reinventing the wheel but how can we make a good product better yeah and and it came to him as hey i already own a company that does metal plating and he's got all the equipment to do all the metal plating in his other company yeah, that's when the whole process of copper plating the bismuth pellet um, came about. He started testing it, and we were seeing increased results in pattern percentage and downrange lethality um, increase just by the plating. So what that did was, upon impact, it's holding those bismuth pellets more spherical because bismuth is a lot like the same characteristics of lead. Yeah. Um, it, it's a malleable alloy and upon setback, it can deform a little bit or lose a true spherical shape. So the copper plating helps it hold a more spherical shape and it flies true or therefore um, staying true to course, so to speak. Um, and, and that's where we started cutting our teeth with the copper plating trademark. And, and that, okay, that makes, that makes a lot of sense to me. And, and I know one thing that, I, I do know one thing that you guys are big on and, and one thing that you use to, to promote your product a lot is, is the, the decrease in number of cripples when it comes to shooting your product. Right. And I, and I think, you know, I, I know there's a bunch of people out there that, that are shooting what they're shooting and, and they've got their reasons to shoot the ammo mm -hmm. that they're shooting. And, and I'm not here to, to say that, they're wrong or, or whatever. And, and their reasons are their reasons, but I do feel that there is a, a huge movement right now within the waterfowling community. Um, and it, it's not really, uh, it's not really a certain age group. It's just, it's just, um, where you are as a waterfowl hunter, but there are a lot of people that are considering um, when they do the math to spend the, the extra money on the shell, that's going to provide less cripples because the math tells them, well, it may be a little bit more out of my pocket initially, but I'm not having to 
use three shells to to kill that honker, right? Like that, chasing that's exactly in a right. canoe or something, going through more and more shells just to try and finish that bird off. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. That's exactly right. So, so the reason, you know, and, and we are big advocates for that because the advantages of going to our, our product compared to the steel product, which we also carry a steel line as well. But yeah. when you go, when you go to a denser alloy, you can drop your pellet size, which then increases the amount of pellets per payload. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it's not only giving you the advantage of you're having more pellets flying, but you're also having the, the advantage of smaller pellets and they're holding up to the same flying distance ratio as what your heavier steel shot would. So, you know, call it 33% more pellets in a, you know, 33% give or take more pellets in a bismuth load because you can drop two shot sizes compared to shooting a steel. Wow. Um, so, I mean, you're, you're up in your pellet count. You can even back off your actual payload size if you wanted to, which we're, we're fans of kind of the heavier side of payloads, but that's, yeah. that's just kind of how we've, we've found our recipes of what works best for us, what performs the best. And, and that, and that's where we are. Um, but but given the advantage of more pellets flying, like I said, you get more margin for error and you get more chances to actually make contact with that bird and it still retain the energy to, to lethally take it out, you know, immediately instead of just breaking a wing or, or, you know, clipping it and, and it just falling down or sailing. Right. Um, so within ethical range, you have greater chances of hitting the bird and cleanly taking it out and it's done there. Yeah, and I, I guess there's really two directions you could go with this, right? So, um, and Craig, I know you'll probably chime in on this, but there's two directions, right? So you can look at it from from the money sense. Um, in the long run, you're probably going to be saving money because you're using less shells to do, to uh, to get those birds. But then on the other side, as a as a outdoorsman woman person it is our responsibility to do to do our best job at humanely dispatching that animal as possible right like that that's our responsibility as hunters and and anglers and and whatever so 100 percent you know what i mean so I get it, right? Like I know everybody's working hard for their money and they're stretching dollars where they can and stuff like that. But there is somewhat of a responsibility as hunters that we have to do what's right by the by the animal bird that we're that we're chasing. Well, I, I I did I do remember seeing on bosses. I think it was a YouTube page talking about that and just the numbers. And I can't remember if it was on one of your episodes uh, with Pattern Pros, Damian. I remember somebody kind of busting out some numbers talking about cripples and, you know, if you decrease it by like how many birds that, that equates to across yeah. North America. Right. So it's like, that's, that's, that's a huge thing. Well, just that's looking exactly at, right. Just looking at the boss webpage here right now, as we're, as we're doing this, you know, the estimate that boss is throwing out is, you know, 3.4 to 3.7 million birds lost each year to crippling like that's a staggering number Mm -hmm. i don't think um you know like when you're out with your buddies and hey listen we've all we've all had some get away on us um and And it's gonna happen yeah and it's gonna happen it's gonna happen right yeah 100 percent. and and i and i know you're not here saying that boss is gonna eliminate every cripple Um, because you know, there's some asshat that's going to say, well, Aaron was on the show and said, (laughs) um, if I shoot this, I'll never have a cripple. So that's the disclaimer that I'll get out right there. Um, right. But 3.4 million or 3.4 to 3.7, that's a stagger. Like, I don't know if many people realize just how big a number 3.4 million is. If, if you're it's a, lot of, it's a lot of birds that is an insane amount of birds dude so if you can decrease that by like a fraction of a percent that's still a lot of birds right like 
Right. Oh yeah. And I mean, yeah. and, and, and we as, and we as waterfowlers, I mean, and I'm not, I'm not throwing this as a sales pitch here, but it is the shells are the cheapest thing we buy to go hunting. <laughs> I mean, yeah. If, if, if you can make the claim that you don't want to spend three fifty four hundred dollars a case of shells that's fine i don't care yeah you know i i don't care but if you shoot the cheaper shells and you shoot two or three well yeah i mean let's say let's say a decent steel load is in the market of a dollar a squeeze well if you shoot two times yeah you've you've now spent the same amount of money or more than if you did a more premium product yeah you know yeah, it's like I, not I'll wanting to put it, the I, money into a good pair of tires on your car, and then they keep going flat, or they blow up on the highway, and <laughs> you know now you're that, swerving all that's over. That's exactly right? that's exactly right. And so, and you know, and that's why we have to really, really hone in with the the ethical yardages of what something is designed and built for. Right. Um, like like we just launched our steel reserve line this year, like this mm-hmm. uh, this spring. Yeah. And we market it 100% as a 30 to 35 yard in shell. Mm-hmm. Well, of course, like, you know, we're going to have the people or you're going to have or anybody, there's going to be the people that shoot beyond that. And yeah. then they're going to, they're going to knock it and say whatever they want to say. But right. if you shoot it for what it's designed purpose is, you should have no qualms, no issues. If you as the operator do your part, and, you know, if the shooter does his part, there should be no issues. Granted, you're going to have, you're going to have the cripples every now and then still just like, you know, just like anything else. It's not, it's not to say you won't ever have that, but you're not going to have the sailors at 30 yards that you would, if you're shooting at 40 and 50 yards with the, you know, the wrong, the wrong artillery. Yeah. Um, If you use it for its design purpose, that's, that's where we like to live with it. And you decrease your odds a lot greater by doing that yeah and and to me it makes sense the only the only argument i think that i would not that it matters if i accept the argument or not because who cares what i say is i say but the only thing that i could understand is if somebody said well i just don't have the money up front to pay um for that case up front i can buy um the non-premium per box as i need them and then i could be like yeah i could buy that but and 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 that's understandable and that's that's perfectly understandable and that's um you know i don't want to keep harping on the cost of things as much as the the quality of things but i mean that's why we built we built the best steel load we felt that was feasibly possible to go in the box to start in the lineup of our better and best selection of shells that we already offer yeah um and so and that's we're doing the due diligence of there is how can we make this better than you know than what is on the market by cleaner building more eco-friendly and then pushing it for its design intention yeah well it makes sense buddy and 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 again i didn't so every so that everybody can have something that is a premium product to shoot yeah um Hey, and listen, so that's... and let's not, let's not, uh, you guys are coming out and, and this is to get off the ammo topic, but another side of the business is the apparel side of the business. And I'm telling you, you guys are coming out with some amazing look and apparel. And, and I'm, when I was down in Baton Rouge, I seen the hats and I seen the hoodies and I seen the t-shirts and people walking around wearing them. And that's another side of the, of the business. And, and when you can create an apparel line that that looks good and people want it that's just even better for the brand and and just getting even that much more exposure correct right that is that's that's correct yeah that's correct and i mean we you know we strive to be the best products that we can buy um and no offense to y'all up there but we try to keep everything as american made as we possibly can to keep american workers with jobs and yeah. keep everything you know, as, as best off as we can here. Um, and so and that's what we strive for. Well, and, and, you know, it benefits, uh, there's no, there's no offense taken. It benefits us when everything's American made 
And I'll tell you why it benefits us, because when it's 100 percent American made um, and here and this is a rant that I'll go on. And, and Aaron, you can tell me to shut up if you want. But um, <laughs> like you always hear this, you always hear this um, narrative of we got to stop doing stuff overseas and we got to focus on doing stuff in America. I say North America um, and but you could call it we need to do more manufacturing in Canada, more manufacturing in the U.S. And and you continually hear this narrative from people that we need to do this because the quality coming out of overseas is not the same as what it would be if it was made in, in North America. But sure. the problem is, is that as soon as there's a price attached, because there is a price attached with getting stuff done in North America and America and, and Canada, mm -hmm. people tend to balk at it then, right? They're like, oh, well, you know, I could get it. I can get it cheaper. Yeah, but you're the guy that was just telling me that you wanted it made in America. So there, there's a cost to getting things done in America. That's so, exactly right. So we are big fans of stuff being made in America because of the free trade deal. So we don't have, if it's 100% made in America, we don't pay duties on it crossing the border. So that benefits us. That benefits. Oh, okay. The, that's, that, that's something yeah. I did not know. Yeah. That benefits the Canadian consumer. So like you, if your hoodies, and I, I'll tell you how I know this is because I brought this up to Craig Mintz with real geese decoys out of Ohio. And I, mm -hmm. I told him the same thing. I'm like, man, listen, if you can, if you can get your free trade documentation, whatever you need to do to get that, I have no idea, but if you can get that sorted, you're going to set yourself above and beyond most of your competitors because they're not made in, in the U S and if you can prove you're 100% made in the U S then we skip the duties, which is a huge savings for Canadian consumers. And that's is... when guys are ordering stuff online and yeah. then they find it's yeah, oh, it's a great price, even with the exchange, but then they find out about the duties. Oh yeah. Pay as well. Right. And then all of a sudden it wasn't worth it. Yeah. Right. Like, that that's the thing. Like we can order, like I can go on, well, not ammo, but I could go on and order something online, get a great price. Like Craig said, the exchange rate is, is, is shit right now, but you know, you can deal with it because the price is okay. Um, but then when UPS or or um, FedEx shows up at your door, they hit you with another 50 or 60 bucks, depending on what it is. Then you got to, you know, pay another pile of money just to get, uh, just to get them to release it because of the duties, right? So that's something oh, that, yeah. So it's something that, I, you know, I, I'm sure a lot of people know, but I think there's, there's just as many that don't know that, hey, listen, we really appreciate made in America. We'll pay the, we'll mm. pay the extra for, for the product because at the end of the day, we escape the duties. So we come out we come out better uh, on the end of it. it. That's my opinion anyways, Craig. No, that's that's a that's a valid point that, I you know, I've never can I'm, I wouldn't have considered or known. Yeah. And, and it is man, like, and it makes a big difference because, you know, as, as our buddy Phil, that's on the show, 20 bucks is 20 bucks, right? <laughs> hey, 20 <laughs> bucks is 20 bucks. That's, that's exactly right. I, mean, I don't think it's a commonly known thing because even like you look at Craig and real geese, for example, it's like, how long have they been shipping yeah. up here? And, and I'm sure yeah. hearing the complaints about the duties and stuff like that. And that was, that was only a recent thing, right? Yeah. When, when he was able to get that changed. Yeah, it's only been yeah, it's only been you know in the last couple months maybe. Yeah, probably six seven months. Like by the time he started the process and and the whole bit. So and which is making a huge difference for him because now he can ship across the border and the shipping is still ridiculous, but um, they save on the duties, which is which is massive. So, anyways, sure, something to think about. Um, I did want to bring up this idea and, and I've, I've asked a few people Aaron and and I'm I'm curious about your response to it do you think the interest in the trade like the shows are coming back and coming back bigger like so you would have been you were in at the Delta one in, in Baton Rouge were you did you do game fair this past week we didn't we no no okay. we have not done game fair oh. um so far this year, we have done the National Wild Turkey uh, Show. Yeah, 
Yeah. We've Nashville. done Squad Fest. Right. Which was the dive bomb show in St. Louis. Yeah. Then we came down and did Baton Rouge, which was the Delta Expo. Yeah. Our next show will be the Wisconsin Waterfowlers Expo up there. Right. And yeah. then um we'll do we'll do another smaller one, Duck Fest in St. Louis again. Okay. And then the one out in um um I'm Would drawing a blank. Harrisburg. No, not not Great American show, uh outdoor show. It's the uh uh I wanna say it, it's it May no East of Maryland. East of Maryland. Oh, East that show. Yep. 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 The World Goose Show up there. Yeah. Yeah. That one's that Our, one's usually in November, I think, right? That's correct. Yep, yeah, that's correct. But but so, as you're as you're traveling around, do you think that you're because there was a there was a stretch there where people weren't showing up to shows, right? And but to me, it seems like people are interested in shows again. I think so. Here, here is my general consensus, in my opinion, on what shows are doing for us now. Since there is more and more online consuming and less big box retailers and the the shift in the market of buying and selling is is going different directions there's not as much option to put hands on a product at any mm-hmm. given time and with people being able to represent the company and be in front with that company at the trade show with the product people who have such as like such as you being down there you know at the at the expo yep. You're able to get in front of the people that work for the company, the people that have the na- the knowledge and the brains behind of it, and and can usually obtain you know a better idea of what you're buying, what you're looking at, or get a little odds and ends that you might not get from, you know, just being in a big box store there, you know, and just an associate helping on the aisle, or um, and and a lot of times it shows there's a little bit of a of, of a show special or whatever. So yeah. I think I think that's one reason we're starting to see it ramp back up. Yeah. Um but I think you know it's I, I'm still kind of a little bit of mixed. I feel like they're still doing good and then sometimes you'll see some and you you're just like, "Oh, well that might have been right." Yeah. I, yeah, I guess you can't you can't really paint everything with the same brush, but I I uh, I sort of kind of agree with what you're saying. I think as a society now, everybody is so everybody is so busy and, and everybody wants um uh, when they want something, they want it now. So right. So when everybody jumped on to online shopping, it was such a it was such a game changer, right? You go online, get your stuff and it's shipped out to you the next day, easy peasy. But then if you didn't get a chance to touch it, feel it, try it on, all that stuff, well, then there was a chance that you had to send that back. And then so returns, which turned into a nightmare. And I think most mm-hmm. most businesses will would agree that returns are a nightmare. So now I feel people are like, listen, I don't, I'm not going to buy something um, without touching it or, or, or at least getting some solid feedback on it. And that's, and that's why I think people are are lining up to come back into shows. They know what they want. I don't think you're going to sell them on, unless it's something wild that they haven't had a chance to see, but I think most people know what it is that they want. And then they come into the shows just to confirm fit, feel all of that stuff. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, mm-hmm. you know, they walk away and, because you know, even at Baton Rouge, there was some stuff for sale, but there was there was a lot of brands that weren't selling anything. They were just there to answer questions and and to tell people exactly what it is that that their product is all about. Well, right, I think right. Another thing to that to kind of go along with it is people are seeing every everybody's got a YouTube channel, right? Especially all these big brands, yeah. they they've got all these these uh, personalities and that. So everybody sees these companies, they see the people associated with them. And one thing I always talk about is that, you know, it's like, okay, I watch this guy on YouTube. He seems great. He talks about this product, but there, there's, you know, there, there's a reason why he's talking about a product on, you know, on, either on TV or YouTube. Uh, so I think like the things like the shows, you get a chance to meet that person that you normally only see on screen. 
-hmm. and get a sense and a rapport and say, okay, like, is this guy on board with this product because he actually, right. you know, he, he, believes, he in believes in it, it. Yeah. or is it just, you know, somebody bullshitting me and trying to sell me something. Right. So I think going right. to shows, even if you're not selling at the time as a consumer, like that's, that's what I get out of it too. Right. Like I can, I can meet yep. this guy and it's like, yeah, I had this impression of, of so-and-so by watching him on YouTube, but I meet him and it's like, it's clear. He's just, he's just there because he's, you know, he's getting the product and, and he's there as part of the show. But uh, yeah, right. like I think I think that's a huge benefit as a consumer or, you know, I'm sure from the business standpoint where it's like, yeah, it's like you can get that message across. You can not only are people getting their hands on the product, but they're yeah, they're they're getting that level of comfort that comes with with meeting those people associated. With sure. It. Yeah. And and I will say you're you're exactly right with with trade shows being a huge face recognition, common ground to meet because everybody's there and nobody's having to go out of their way. And, you know the majority of the people that are probably associated or working for a company in the outdoor industry are going to be there. So you can knock two birds out with one stone. And, and it's just, and it's usually a good time. You're getting to hang out with, yeah. with new people, getting to hang out with people that are friends and um, they're just a good time. Now they can, they can get long winded. I will say there are a few shows out there that are, you know, yeah. back in the day when you never, when you couldn't order online, I feel trade shows were at their peak because yeah. everybody wanted to go buy their product in person there at the same place. And they could get this, 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 and this, you know, they get their shotgun shells or decoys, possibly even a gun, possibly their new set of waders, and they could knock all their shopping out for one day. Mm -hmm. Whereas now, um, like I, I, I don't want to knock this, but let's just take game fair. I mean, it's a two week show. Well, yeah, that's a long know, time, just, man. That's a long stretch. It takes that. It takes so much time out of everybody's schedule to be at a show for two weeks when the majority of companies in the outdoor industry are really rather smaller than what most people feel they are. Oh, 100%. And, and um, the, the, the price tag to attend a show for two weeks. Right. Right. It's just, it's almost sometimes not justifiable because of you, you're just there so long and then your, your expense of overhead is just, it adds up. And now when you pay two fifty three hundred dollars for a hotel room a night, yeah. you've got multiple people. Well, you yeah. know, it's part of it to stay relevant, to keep face and to, to, you know, be known in the industry. I will say that, but yeah. there are, there are yeah, shows that, that just get long winded and, you know, the Delta show is perfect. A good three day show. If yeah. I, if you could ask me how it could be changed, I would say, let's do it Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Yeah. So everybody can go home Sunday and be back with their families and then rock on to the next, to the next one. Yeah, um, absolutely. But, but being out two weeks somewhere across the country, you know, it's just, it's a lot of logistics planning. Um, and, you know, with the, with the market, like we were talking about of, of trading and selling goods now it's it's all online so um you just it's just not as necessary to be there as long for everybody to get the chance to come by as much as it used to be yeah. um that's not to say it's not not worth it though no no um, it, but it's a balancing act right like the, the america uh can so north america is huge massive mm -hmm. Ma mm -hmm. it's a massive ge geographical thing um so you can't be everywhere you can't attend every show so there's a balancing act hey listen i gotta drive 14 hours and then i've got you know three nights of accommodations and food and travel for six people in the booth it's a huge it's a huge balancing act and and businesses right. can't attend everyone but like you said, you've got there is there is a responsibility from the brand to be out there because you need you need to be at some of them. You can't you can't boycott them all. But the ones no, that make no. the, the ones that make sense, you uh, you uh, you attend. Um, ladies and gentlemen, here this was this was uh, an idea planted to me. We're going to skip just for a quick commercial to one of the sponsors for. The Refuge in 2025. Listen to Kyle Smock from Show Me Ducks. Hey everybody, this is Kyle Smock with Show Me Ducks, a proud sponsor of Punisher Waterfowl's The Refuge this March at the Toronto Sportsman Show. 
Come check us out in the refuge to see the Deep Diver 2.0, the Ice Quacker, and the Mini Quacker. I did want to talk about something that you brought up, um, Aaron, and that was where you said a lot of people thinks, uh, think that these brands are these big, massive entities, and, and they're not. They're, they're small businesses, right? Like, I, I get it. They, they move a lot of product and stuff. I'm a, I consider the Punisher brand a small business, uh, much smaller than, say, Boss and, and Realtree and all these. But they are small businesses. They're not big box stores, these huge conglomerates of, of businesses and stuff. But the one thing, you know, going down to Baton Rouge for me, I got to meet so many people like yourself that I talk to online who I who I be, torment and, and ask for stuff and want them to come <laughs> on the show and stuff. And, but I get a chance down in Baton Rouge to actually, you know, shake a person's hand, meet them, chat. And, and I think, and, and you could correct me if I'm wrong here, but, you know, for for fellas like you, Aaron, and and say Rusty Creasy and and all of these guys, all these these fellas that we're all following, you know, you can have a rapport with someone through through text and email and stuff, but being able to sit down and look somebody in the eye and talk to them, I think that's where you solidify relationships. Would would oh, that absolutely? Be... Yeah, okay, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, and I'd be lying if I said that I did not meet a lot of good friends now from yeah. trade shows. Yeah. Um, we've talked and talked and talked. And then we finally met in person, went out, had a beer such yeah. as you and I did. Yeah. And then, you know, next thing you know, we're hunting together. Next next thing you know, we're our families are hanging out or we're every yeah. time we can, we can meet up somewhere and it might be in a common ground state or it could be. Yeah. You know, just in passing. That's right. That like that was the thing that, you know, and I've always said it how since since we've started this podcast, um, you know, met some pretty amazing people and and it and it shouldn't surprise me, but it always do. So when we did that first party, that first night at at Fred's down in Baton Rouge, like that mm -hmm. party was off the hook it was insane the band was was crazy but it was just so craig it was just the vendors party so it was only the people from the show that were vendors that were at this thing and yes. I'm gonna, everybody was in such a good mood everybody's shaking hands one hey who are you with like they just walk up who are you with they just wanted to know who who what brand were you with and and then you would just mm -hmm. drink beer and and tell stupid stories and, and, and laugh. And it was, it was friggin' amazing. It really was. I had, mm -hmm. to, was, I had that was to, a good evening. Oh man. It was, it was crazy, but that that's what solidifies um, just how tight this, this community is and the industry, right. And you've heard people say, um, you know, it's, it's all a bunch of friends. And if you think everybody is in competition, with, of course there's some competition, but it's not as cutthroat as what you would think it is. Oh no, no, no. It's there. There's, there's not a spot in this, in this industry to be that way. And no, um, and survive and survive along with we're unfortunately we're a dying breed of industry. Yeah. Um, every year it seems like we're getting less and less as far as the outdoorsmen and the people that really, really look to the heritage of what waterfowling and just hunting in general is. So, I mean, there's a lot of people that don't like each other, which that's just part of life, but majority of us out there all are good friends with most people. Yeah. Even, even the competition. I mean, yeah. Well, and, and, and that party just proved it. Like, Everybody was there getting along. There was competition between brands, um, but it didn't affect personal relationships. It, it's, no. hey, you know what I mean? Uh, Craig, I know like you, this whole um, trade show thing and, and, and getting to, to meet the people that come on the show, like this is sort of kind of new to you, but I've heard you say the same thing that, you know, you, you're impressed with just how genuine people are that, that you've met um, over the last, you know, couple of years since you've really gotten into duck hunting. 
Oh, for sure. And and yeah, like, like you said, just I've heard it a bunch of times from a bunch of your different guests when they, they've talked about how it's like, yeah, it's, you know, it's not cutthroat. It's, I know this guy from this, this competitive brand and this competition and, and, you know, they're, they're honestly friends. Right. And yeah. And cause yeah, there's no, there's not room, room for that. And if some, like you, you've seen it, we've seen it just within our, yeah. within our own circles. It's like, there's that one guy that yeah. kind of tries to pull that sort of shit. They don't last very long. Right. No, they yeah, don't. they're not, they're not going to stick around long. And you know, it's, it's kind of funny because of what I say, I've, I've got a saying for it. It's like a, you know, the trade show, it's, it's really like a circuit. So yeah, you don't have very many options except to be friends with the people that are going to be in the circuit at each show every time you go there. Cause yeah. if not, who else are you going to hang out with? Yeah. You know, you've yeah. got, you've got the few people within your company, which you do hang out with all the time. But I mean, we, we go out to parties such as like we did with, with other yeah. people and, you know, have dinner and drinks and going about our evening. And next thing you know, we're back to tending to business and yeah. And on to the next one, you know? Well, so, and I think, I think one of the important things that um, not a lot of people, I and mean, maybe they do realize it, but you know, the trade show is, is great for the consumers, but the people that are behind the brands, it's amazing for them too when it comes to networking. And and like, I don't know how many people pulled me aside. Hey, you need to meet this guy. Or I would do the same mm -hmm. thing. Hey, you need to meet this guy because I think you guys should be working together. There's a, there's a ton of that that goes on. And I honestly believe for them, you know, I'm 99% I'm positive. I can say this with confidence that – most brands are hoping the other brands succeed because I, oh, I yeah. think it's just good for the industry when, when everybody's succeeding, it's just good for the industry. That, that's exactly right. You're, you're exactly right there. Um, nobody wants to see anybody fail because that's just ill will towards humanity. Yeah. Um, you know, that's, I'm not going to say I want to see you succeed more than I do, but I no, do want to see you succeed. <laughs> yeah, no, and no, but that's but that's a normal, but that's a normal um, response or a normal attitude to have. Hey, listen, I don't want you to become bigger than me, but I don't want to see you fail either. Do you know what right. I mean? That that's right. just that's just normal. I don't, and then and nobody should get their their face in a knot over over a statement like that because that's just right. that's just normal. Um, I'll, I'll add one more statement to that, but yep. in order to improve and succeed, you got to have healthy competition and without healthy competition, you become stagnant. So in a stagnant world, you get, you get yep. blah. Yeah. And, and that's yep. where that goes. You get just good enough. You get good just enough. Good. Yeah. That's exact. That's well, exactly right. we're just coming off the Olympics, right? We're just finishing the Olympics and, and whatever, your thought is on the Olympics for the political and, and all that stuff. That's minor. I don't watch it for that. And I don't care for that side of it. But when you look at the athletes um, and you look at, you know, what the athletes are doing today versus 20 years ago, and that is, that is nothing but competition. And, and that's one athlete pushing another to try and be better than, than the record that he or she set. That's what competition, exactly. that's what competition does. You're consistently raising the bar and, and, you know, hoping that, hoping that you stay the best, but there's always someone that's, that's gunning to take you down. And that's, that's oh, yeah. what, and that's the good thing about competition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I did want to talk about this because they're great friends of the show, great friends of mine. And, and I know you guys are, are working with them too. And that's the boys from pattern pro. So Ryan Brody and, and Christian, um, yeah, I know, I know you guys are working with them too. And, and you have this, you know, if you go on, on the, the boss shot shell webpage, they have this, this mantra, put it on paper. And we talk about it all the time that we see it. We hear it all the time. Hey, I've got a, a 400. What's the best ammo to use with it? Listen, don't go to Facebook looking for the answer. Go put some paper up and, and shoot it. And and know what your pattern is. And you guys at Boss are huge advocates for it. And you're working with the Pattern Pro guys just to be able to do that. That that is correct. That is correct. We have uh, we met Brody and the gang there. I think a while back. This was before I was 
100% full time with the company and right. And um, I will say an, an, a coworker kind of built that relationship with those guys there in Oklahoma. And, um, you know, that's kind of where he Brody found that, that void of, okay, there's Pete there, there's this advocate of it, but not enough people with all the other companies yeah. are pushing the same, this same, uh, you know, um, I've lost my words here. They're not, they're not pushing this same story. Right. So what's going to be the common ground of how can you compare this, 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 and this and figure out what's best for your gun. And, you know, starting of a boss, this is what I pretty much did relentlessly trying to figure out, figure out what was best for actually my a 400 20 yep. gauge. And, um, you know, and that's, we were huge advocates for that because if you don't know what's going on down range, you don't know, you don't know what's going to be, you know, what you're going to take, what's going to take place in the field. So if you yeah. don't know what you're shooting, your, your odds are either really good or really bad. Yeah. Um, and it goes back to the crippling rate. You yeah. can still shoot our shell and, and it be a better shell. But if you don't know, if you're shooting a pattern that is a hundred yards wide, or if you're shooting a pattern that's three inches wide, mm -hmm. you, you know, if you don't know what it's doing, your, your odds are not very good for you. So yeah. knowing what you're putting down range is what is a big key to efficiency in the field and, and bagging your game, you know, efficiently. Um, and, so, and so Bro Brody and them have done a good job of voicing that for all brands, um, us as well yep. about what is, what is performing and what, and what guns. And of course, no gun and choke pattern is consistent to every single gun. So the okay. only way to know it is, we can get you in a good spot to start, but yeah. you need to go, you need to put up some paper and then you need to go shoot it and go from there with it. And, and this is me and I'm not putting words in your mouth, Aaron. This is the words coming out of Damian Pittman. Um, but I think if you are, are a brand and if you are sending, you know, ammo to pattern pros, and and for anybody that don't know exactly what they are, they are they are a company that's advocating for you to to pattern your gun properly. And and when you buy from them, you get a you get an assortment of of different brands of ammo for you to of shotgun shells for you to try to figure out what the best density is for your shotgun. And I think that if you're an ammo company and you're um, participating in this with pattern pros, I think it says something about your confidence in your ammo as well by mm -hmm. saying, Hey, listen, we want to partner with these guys. We're so confident in our stuff that we're willing to work with these, these guys and put it up against anything else. That, that's, right. that's the way I look at it. I'm not putting words in your mouth, but that's the way I look at it. I look at it as a, mm -hmm. as a confidence thing from a brand as well. Sure. Because, I mean, before we would even say, before we're even going to release anything new, myself, a few others, and some people that are close with the company itself yep. have shot multiple patterns through multiple chokes at different ranges, have killed X amount of birds with said round. We've got, we've got extensive testing from across the board before we're going to release it to say this is a 100% a, a, a new SKU product line. And mm -hmm. so by that point in time, we do have the confidence to say this shell is going to perform. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, there is the learning curve of saying, okay, this is where you need to, your starting point, and this is where we found what works best in this area. The rest is up to the consumer and the operator to say this is what works best out of my gun. Yeah. Um, because what works best out of my gun might not work best out of your gun. 100%. And, and that's not to say you're not going to have the lemons that that just don't shoot great. I mean, I, I personally have a gun that I had high hopes for it, and it's just it's just okay. Yeah. I've done you know I've done aftermarket work to it, and it's just okay. Um, it just doesn't hold a candle to my other two guns that I primarily shoot, and you know, and that's just that. That's just that particular gun. Yeah. Um, so there are those anomalies, but 
can I still take that gun out and shoot and be consistent with killing birds? Absolutely. But it just does not shoot as well as my other guns. So you will have the anomaly of it doesn't matter how much money you put into something or how much work you put into something that it's still going to be just okay. Yep. Um, but for the masses, we're seeing more and we see more. This is good instead of just okay. Or, you know, the good and greats are far outweighing the okays. Yeah. Make makes and, and that, and that's part of being transparent as a company is, you know, there are some parts that our shell may not you know, our particular shell or that particular line may not be what your gun likes. Yeah. And that's a, and that's a very good point. Like you fully understand. And I think for the most part, most, most people do as well. Um, Hey, listen, like you can, you can drink the Kool-Aid that, um, that bosses, that boss is doing here. But it may not work with your with your platform. It just may not be the right combination because mm -hmm. you said it, Aaron. Not every not every shot shell firearm and choke tube um are the same. It, that's just the way it is. So um, you know, there there is a possibility that you know that what you what you think you need to buy is not gonna work for you. Right, right. And that's and that's the beauty of having in today's world options. Yeah, competition. You've got awesome. you've got options, comp competition, and and different product lines that are like for for example, for example, mm -hmm. when we introduced the War Chief line of shells, I will tell you from personal experience, it takes a little more to get the legacy line dialed into how I want it compared right. to the War Chief line. So therefore. The, the the build quality, I'm not going to say the build quality because they're both high quality builds, but the build design of what makes the War Chief line the superior brother to the Legacy line, one of the factors is it's more responsive to more chokes. Okay. And so, it, so I could dial that War Chief in. I took a lot of my buddy's guns and said, here, I want to shoot this shell compared to what you're shooting right now, whether it was the, the Legacy line that they were shooting or uh, you know, a competition brand and nine out of 10 of them shot that shell 100% better. I'm not going to say 100% better. That, that right. would be wrong, but there was improvement upon almost every other thing they were shooting just because of the design build of that particular shell. Wow. Now that's not to say like, I know with my guns that I've got my guns to where I could shoot I know exactly if I'm shooting the legacy line, what choke I need to use to get the results I, I want. And yeah. I know what what choke and combination of shell I need to use for the War Chief line, along with the Wolfram line, which is our TSS line, along mm -hmm. with our Steel Reserve line. Because I've put in that time right. and, and efforts of patterning that particular gun to say, okay, I need this, this combination with this shell, this combination with this shell, and this combination with this shell. Yeah. Now all of them, I can leave one choke in there, and they're all pretty consistent, minus the 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 wolf from the tungsten. But as far as going back and forth, I can improve on one or the other just by changing the choke because I know what my gun likes. So there's there's that. I will say the design build also helps with what might perform better in some guns. So not to yeah. get off track of what we were saying. No, no, you know. I get no, no, it, it, it totally makes sense. Um, and it do, it totally makes sense. And, and, you know, I understand. And I think, I think the vast majority of, of bird hunters, shooters, they, they understand it too. Um, sometimes I think people just need to be reminded, um, of it. Right. And, and that's, mm -hmm. that's where I think, um, Craig, did you have anything I've been, I've, I've been doing a lot of the talking. One thing I wanted to ask about was just on, I don't know if you want to get into it at all, Aaron, but the, uh, sorry, is it the reserve steel or steel reserve that you guys? Steel just, reserve. Steel reserve. Yeah, steel reserve. Because yeah, I was looking, looking up some videos and that on the release and everything. And it sounded pretty interesting. Like what did you, could you talk a bit about like kind of what went into that? Cause it sounded like it, you guys kind of almost had to start from scratch to develop the steel shell because you guys didn't have any steel before. 
That that is correct. So a little bit of just back history with the brand is going back to being American made. Um, we want we wanted to be able to design and do as many things in America and really in house as possible for two reasons for for the being building the best product, but also quality control. Um, and by doing that, it has allowed us to, we make our own wads now. So we've developed and built our own wads that we only can have. I mean, we've custom built these particular wads and they're also um, eco-friendly. They, they hope possess a biodegradable agent, but we were able, by doing that, we've been able to tweak and make modifications to how we want something to perform. And so within that, we built the first, the first shell was the War Chief. Um, we built and designed that wad and that, that became a true success for, um, for the brand as a whole. Um, improvement, just all around improvement there off of the legacy line. So when we started looking into the steel reserve line, what we did was we built a modified wad, a, we modified the wad that we use for the war chief to build that design to create it to be the most efficient shell we could like i was saying going back to so that shell so that wad would release the pellets as efficiently as it could to be a 30 and 35 yard shell and in so by doing that that's where we created the steel reserve line which came off of a modified war chief wad um, we use precision cut copper plated steel um, and we just built it from there. And so by, by, by that design build, we found we've got the best, I don't want to say this cheap because it's not cheap, but it's the best quality steel shot for the dollar along with being eco-friendly at that. And that's something uh, like I think before I started coming on the show, I know you've talked about a few times, Damien, with other guests too. It's like the whole wad aspect too, right? And and how much plastic is going out out there. Yeah. Like we do, we everybody does their best to pick up their their shells, but then you've got all these wads that yeah, you know, maybe you get a couple, but they're they're just floating around out there, right? Because I mean, you you take it, and I've been on several of these shoots, but let's just say a snow goose conservation hunt where people uh -huh. are just ripping ten, <laughs> ten rounds of yeah, you know a ten rounds of go. Yeah. The next thing you know, when you've picked up all the decoys, your ground still looks white because you've got white hole or white wads sitting out there on the ground. And nobody thinks to pick up the thousand wads that got shot, but mm. you pick up the holes because they're sitting there shining in front of you. Yeah. Um, and it and it, it it does make a difference. So not only by being able to go eco friendly with those and a biodegradable agent in them, um, we've we've been able to make the wad specifically to how we wanted to build that shell. Um, one which thing I caught is, on the one video too was uh, was how open it, you guys were about how uh, impressed, well, how surprised you were at the effectiveness and how how good the shells turned out when you had designed them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we we thought, you know, and and here's the thing, and I had a lot of people at Delta ask, you know, so what's the difference between the steel reserve and your bismuth? And I said, well. You know, we're not we're not trying we're not trying to reinvent the game with this product. It is still still shot. I mean, it is there's no there's no way around that. It's not any more effective than any other steel shot. Yeah. But the way we've designed the fit the load to be efficient and work consistently is what makes it that much better than the next guys or the competition, which we built it to be. And, you know, we built it to be, like I said, the 30 and 35 yard in shell um, for the starters who want to be, get into the brand, but may not have the budget to be able to afford the bismuth or for the guys that want to shoot in the timber or, or, you know, small marsh pockets or potholes mm -hmm. that they're not shooting beyond those distances. Um, and that's where that, that load lives. Um, so we started with that and then we say that's your good and then we go up to your legacy which is better and then you go to the war chief is what we're going to call best 
and then the TSS just lives in a world of its own just because it's tungsten. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, that's not, I don't want to say it's affordable because people do affordable, but for people efficiently decoying birds, it, it doesn't really, it doesn't really have its place. It's more of a cripple cleanup load than it is a, you know, it's a long range shell yeah. is what it is. Yeah. Um, I'm not trying to turn people away from that. It's just, it's a 35 plus yard shell. Yeah. Um, I know when I was doing the prototypes, I found that it was way it patterned way too tight, even shooting a cylinder choke to shoot birds within 30 yards. I, right. I mean, I found myself missing my first shot because it was just throwing it right in front of them. Yeah. Um, and so, the, and, but that's where that lives, but you know, back to the, and that was another load. We, every load we have, we have designed and built it to perform exactly how we wanted it to. Um, and so the steel reserve just happened to be the last one on the list to get designed because we wanted it to be effective for that yardage. And so we tinkered with it till we got it where we wanted it. No, oh, makes sense. But, and, and it just shows your commitment to get something out to everybody too. Right. Because and, exactly. Yeah. Cause you know, you want to, you want to be able to get something out to everybody and you want everybody to be able to, to take part in the brand and stuff. Sorry, Craig, if I jumped on you there. No, um, no. Uh, I was just going to add to that. It was just, uh, again, getting a product out there, but not for the sake of just putting your name on a right. steel load, right? Like putting out, putting out a product that you wanted to put out or that, that you were willing to put out. Yeah. Right. Right. We weren't just going to put out a steel line just to be putting it out. We had to, we wanted to put some thought and design into it for what it was going to be worth. Um, and, and that's exactly what we did. Aaron, buddy, um, we've taken up about an hour of your time and, and I know you are extremely, extremely busy. Um, so we won't take any more of your time up today. Uh, but I will say this, um, please come back and join us on the show again sometime because yeah, absolutely. We'd, we'd love to pick your brain a little bit more. Um, we'll, uh, we'll do a quick round the table with some final thoughts and, uh, and we'll end yeah. it right there. Uh, Craig to you, buddy. Well, nothing else for me. Aaron, it's good chatting with you and, uh, thanks for sharing the info you did. Yeah, absolutely. You too, Craig. Um, Aaron, any last words, buddy? Um, I will say for those for those those consumers who have not yet, you know, reached out to Boss or considered using Boss, if you have questions, reach out to us via info at bossshotshells.com or or send us a message through the Boss fan page on Facebook and our our customer service team and myself are glad to help any way we can and um appreciate you having us on the show and hopefully we can get into a, another conversation later on down the line. Yeah, absolutely, buddy. Um, I appreciate you. Uh, I appreciate you taking some time out of your busy schedule to do the show and, uh, you know, and to be a, a solid dude when we met down in, down in Baton Rouge. I appreciate, um, I appreciate you coming on buddy and, and, and making some time for us. Cause like I said, I do know how, uh, how busy you are. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Union 0430 podcast. We are not experts, nor will we ever pretend to be experts. Just a bunch of friends love hanging out, talking anything duck or goose hunting. Big love. Surround yourself with good people and see you next week.